In the high and far off times, the Babas, the storytellers of old, spoke of a flower. Deep in the forests, hidden among the ferns, there it grew. On any other night, it would look as ordinary as any of the other ferns, plain and without merit. Oh, but come a certain summer night, the eve of St. John's, on the shortest night of the year. Only then would the flower bloom. And bloom it would, with such a beauty to behold. Petals shining in rich shades of blue and gold. And the center, at the heart of the flower, a brilliant glow that rivaled that of the heavens themselves. But as the sun would rise and the cock would crow, so too would the flower vanish into the crisp morning air of summer. But if one were so brave enough to uproot the flower from the earth, oh, such riches to be had. This, in one form or another, was the tale that the Babas would tell. And such a tale did one Baba tell to a boy, a young boy of fourteen, named Jockus. Now young Jockus came from a humble farming family. His mother and his elder brother would till the lands and reap the harvest. Hardy, honest work had they. But Jockus was not interested in such toils, much to the dismay of his family. He was much too busy listening to stories and legends. And this flower that the old Baba spoke of, this flower became his every thought. They lived on the very edge of the woods that was said to hold the flower. And if he could find that flower, if he could unearth it, such riches to be had, his whole family would never need to work again. They'd live like nobles, like kings. The eve of St. John approached, and Jacques pleaded to his family, asking to leave his work for the day and venture into the woods. His brother scoffed at the thought, shirking from his work once again, all in the pursuit of some story. His mother, however, was a wise woman, and she knew that his thirst for adventure was great. Very well, my child, said the mother. You may go into the woods in search of your flower, but if morning comes and your flower is gone, then you will return home. You will work our fields without fuss, and that will be the end of it. The boy thanked and thanked and thanked his mother, and so he took off into the woods in search of his flower. The night was moving quickly, the boy could tell. He went as fast as he could, deeper and deeper into the heart of the woods. It was a hot summer night, but in these woods the air was crisp. A cool layer of mist hung in the air, nipping at the boy. The rocks were steep and slippery, the underbrush was rough, the forest itself seemed bent on protecting its treasure, but on the boy pressed. I must be getting closer, Jockus said to himself. Look how the trees get thicker and thicker. And indeed, the trees were getting thicker, to the point where they resembled mountains more than actual trees. Each trunk a good half mile wide, the sheer size of them boggled the boy's mind. But Jockus would not be stopped. Onward he pressed, around the trees like mountains, closer and closer and closer to the heart of the woods until... He was too late. The cock crowed. The sun broke through the trees. And for a brief moment, out of the corner of his eye, Jackus could see a glimmer of blue and gold. And the flower faded away with a cackle. <laughs> The boy began to slog back home, a journey, strangely enough, that took little more than a half hour. He wished it took longer, for he had no flower and no riches to show his family. But he could not hide from his family forever. When he arrived home, his mother gave him his breakfast and then sent him off in the fields to work with his brother. And so Jockus returned home. And so he worked without fuss. But it will not be the end of it. Not yet. The seasons came and went. By day, the boy did as he was told. He tended to the fields and sold their harvest to the people in the village. Once or twice, a villager would comment on his eyes, how they swear they saw a glint of gold in his bright blue eyes. But Jockus paid them no heed. 
but by night as his family slept, the boy would wander into the woods. He'd explore every inch and mark his travels on old pieces of cloth. He would know these woods by heart. And so the year passed, and St. John's Eve came again. Jockus waited until his mother and brother drifted off to sleep. He gathered his cloth charts and went into the woods. No longer was the air crisp and chilling like the year before. On this summer night the woods were warm and stifling, as if a thick blanket draped over the entire forest. The boy looked on his charts. The path to his left would curve around the rough underbrush, and so to the left he went. As Jockus went further down the path, he took pause. These paths were not familiar to him, unmarked territory on his chart, perhaps. He retraced his steps to find more familiar footing. But no, even the place he came from seemed foreign to him. All the time he spent charting each inch of these woods, all wasted. For what was the use of a map when the very woods themselves seemed bent on changing? He threw his scraps of cloth aside and just ran forward as fast as he could. If planning would not prevail, then sheer determination would. The rough underbrush clawed at his heels. The stifling heat weighed him down, but onward he pressed. At last, Jockus reached the heart of the woods. There, in the middle of the clearing, lit by the warm moonlight, was the flower. The boy could not believe his eyes. The flower was as beautiful as the old Baba had told him. Rich shades of blue and gold. A glow that rivaled the heavens themselves. Such riches to be had. And they were his for the taking. Jockus reached down to uproot his prize and was met with a sharp pain. He stumbled back and cradled his hand. The flower's thorns had drew blood. He had not noticed the thorns before. The boy sighed and leaned back against a nearby rock. Perhaps he would take a moment to catch his breath. There were still a few hours left on this warm summer night. And the flower seemed in no hurry to go anywhere, given its thorny bout of resistance. So the boy rested his weary head and dozed off. When Jockus opened his eyes, he was met with the glaring light of the noon sun. He jerked up and looked around. There was his home in the distance, just across the hillsides. He was at the edge of the woods once more. The clearing and the flower were no more. When he finally trudged his way back home, he went to his mother and apologized for shirking from his work. He had made no mention that he had went after the flower once more. Neither did his mother ask him. She simply sent him off in the fields to work with his brother and returned to her own work. And so Jockus returned home. And so he worked without fuss. But it will not be the end of it. Not when he was so close. The seasons came and went. Jockus worked hard and did as he was told. At night, while his family slept, he would climb up the hill near the edge of the woods. He wouldn't go into them. He knew there was no point trying to chart it out. Still, he would just sit on the hillside. He'd stare into the depths of the woods, hoping to see a glint of blue and gold. And again, the eve of St. John's came. In the dark of the warm summer night, Jockus departed once more, this time with leather gloves to protect him from the thorns. Over the hillside he went, towards the edge of the woods, But he stopped. At the head of the path stood his elder brother. The brother implored him to return home. Stop chasing after these stories, his brother said. Your place is with your family on the farm. But Jockus would not be swayed. This is for all of us, said the boy. Once I finally take the flower, we never need to work again. We live like nobles, like kings. His brother said nothing, but looked at him with solemn eyes. Then, without word, he walked past him 
and slowly made his way back home. Jockis stood a moment in silence. Then he turned and made his way into the woods. This time, the woods were neither chilling nor stifling. The weather was calm, and the winds were kind. There were no trees the size of mountains. There was no movement among the groves. There was only a single straight path towards the heart of the woods. The way was long, and the calm was oddly unnerving. But still, the boy pressed onward. At last, Jockist reached the heart of the woods. There again, in the middle of the clearing, was the flower. The boy was taking no chances this time. He slipped on his gloves and bent down towards the flower. Do not bother with those gloves. I will not prick you a second time. Jockis was taken aback. He was not used to hearing a flower talk. The flower continued. You are a persistent boy. For two years you have tried to uproot me. And for two years, my magic has kept you at bay. Jockus gathered himself and approached the flower with great care. You won't keep me from taking your riches as my own, said the boy. Not this time. <laughs> the flower's cackle echoed through the trees, sending shivers down the young boy's spine. I have been rooted here for ages and have grown bored of my games with you. No, I will not stop you a third time. All your earthly desires, anything and everything you could wish for, take what is yours. The boy's eyes shined with a glint of gold, and he reached for the flower. But be warned, said the flower. All will be yours but only yours. You cannot share your riches with anyone, else you will lose everything. That is the price for my power. The boy was taken aback. Everything he could ever want was right in front of him. But what of his family? How could he live like a king while his family worked in squalor? There had to be a way, some way that he could help them. Perhaps he could- This pact will not last, interrupted the flower. In mere moments, the cock will crow, and you will never find me again. The flower spoke true. The light of morning was beginning to pierce through the trees. All the world's riches. But only for him, anything and everything. But what of his family? Choose! Jockis took hold of the flower and pulled. <laughs> the flower's cackle grew and grew. Pines began to wrap around the boy's arms. The tendrils snaking closer and closer to the boy's chest until... They pierced through, enveloping his very heart. The bargain was made. The flower's magic was now his to wield. The air was deathly silent. Jockis dropped to his knees. I've left my family to suffer, cried the boy. How can I show my face to them again? You won't, said the flower. You can disappear. You can make the most of your gift. Will it in your mind, and it will be so. And so the boy got up. He clasped his hands together, closed his eyes, and willed it. From the thicket of trees came a golden carriage, driven by the finest of horses. The door opened up, and the boy climbed in. The crisp morning air chilled the land. The carriage carried the boy deeper and deeper into the forest. A blur of greens and browns glimmered across the windows. How fast he was going, he could not say. At last, the trees gave way to a glorious mountain of a castle, hidden deep in the woods. Majestic, 
otherworldly. His. The inside of the castle, just as grand as the outside. A warm glow lit the fine walls with new life and mirth. This place is beautiful, the boy thought aloud, but it feels so... empty. That is a simple problem to fix, reminded the flower. And as the boy willed it, the halls were filled with servants and maids, courtiers and musicians. All sorts of people, and all at his command. And so the boy began his new life. The spirit of festivity took hold over the castle. Feast with the strongest of drinks and the most hearty of dishes. The liveliest of dancing, led by the finest of singers and musicians. And the stories the bards would spin beside the roar of the fire. Grand tales of adventure, of daring, of horror, of romance. The night stretched on for days. Days into weeks. Weeks into months. Until the sights and sounds became too much for the young boy. He stumbled past the servants. Past the dancers. Past the musicians. Past the bards. Until the boy found sanctuary in the calm of the castle gardens. A year had passed him by in the fervor of festivity. But it was quiet here. The crisp morning air, the smell of the flowers, it all put his heart at ease. And with it came back memories of the farm he once lived at, of his mother and his brother. But the memory of their faces were not as sharp as they once were. He needed to see them again, if only from a distance, then he would be happy. And so, with the flower's magic, he summoned his golden carriage once more, and off through the woods they went. After a time, the carriage came to a stop at the edge of the forest, where the trees ended and the grassy hills began. The boy stepped out into the noon sun and began to climb the hills on foot. The tall grasses would keep him hidden from any onlookers. I would not look to home if I were you, said the flower. Nothing good will come from it. But the boy did not listen to the flower. He kept climbing up the hills, closer and closer to his village, until at last he saw his farm, and he saw his family. There was his mother, sitting on her chair in front of their house, mending old clothes and blankets. And there was his elder brother, tending to the crops as he usually was. His mother dropped her yarn and began to cough. <coughs> the elder brother looked up from his work and to his mother with worry. But the mother lifted up her hand. <coughs> Don't worry about me, said the mother. It was just a cough. There's still life left in these old bones of mine. After a pause, the elder brother nodded. He bent down to pick up his tools but stopped as he noticed a silhouette from the corner of his eye on top of the hillsides. The boy ducked down into the grass. Minutes passed in silence as he hid from his brother's eye. Slowly and carefully, he peeked through the grass. There was his mother, back to her mending. There was his brother, eyes focused on his work. As quietly as he could, the boy crept away, back down to the edge of the forest. The flower was right. He had already known he couldn't bear showing his face again, and seeing his family had only made the fact so much sadder. But at least he knew that his family was still okay without him. He climbed back into his carriage and went back to his castle. And so the boy began to drown his sorrows once more in the spirit of festivity. Hearty feasts and drinks. Lively dancing and music. Grand tales of adventure, of daring, of horror, of romance. Once more, the night stretched on into days. Days into weeks. Weeks into months. Until another year had passed him by. Once more, the boy found sanctuary in the calm of the castle gardens, 
thinking of his family. The memory of his family's faces were fading, but the longing in his heart remained fervent. If he could simply go once more to see his family, even in disguise, just to make sure they were all right, then he would be happy. And so, with the flower's magic, he summoned his golden carriage once more, and off through the woods they went. They came to stop at the edge of the forest, and the boy began to climb the hills once more towards his home. The boy knew he would not be able to show his face to his family, so he willed the flower to grant him a disguise. And so the flower gave him a cloak. The boy donned it, and he took the form of an old, weary traveler. Not even his family would recognize him. Jockus, now as an old man, made his way down the hill and found his way to the farm. He stopped at the edge of the gate. There was his elder brother, who rose from his work in the fields and met with this strange old man. He offered the man a cup of water, for he obviously was weary from his travels. He thanked the elder brother and asked him, Surely you do not work these fields all by yourself? Yes, answered the brother. It was not always so. Once I worked these fields with my mother and my younger brother. And where is your mother? asked the man. My mother, said the elder brother, is resting inside. And where is your brother? asked the man. The elder brother took pause, his brow furrowed in sorrow. My brother, he answered, wandered deep into the woods two years ago. He has not been seen since, and I fear he is lost forever. I am sorry to hear that, the man replied. He took pause. If I were your younger brother, I would not want you to worry for me. The elder brother stood for a moment. Before he could respond, a furious coughing came from inside the house. It was the boy's mother who sounded quite ill. The elder brother took the cup and bid the man safe travels. He rushed inside the house and attended to his poor mother. Jocka solemnly went back over the hills and to the edge of the woods. He removed the cloak and once again took his own young form. If his first return home brought him such sadness, it was nothing compared to this visit. His heart weighed heavy with regret. But he could not bear to think of such things. So he climbed back into his carriage, and once more he returned to the castle. The boy tried to drown his sorrows again with endless festivities. Hearty feasts and drinks. Lively dancing and music. Grand tales of adventure, of daring, of horror, of romance. Once more, the night stretched on into days. Days into weeks. Weeks into months. But they brought no pleasure to young Jackus. He had spent the past three years consumed by the solitude of his own wealth and power. Hidden away from his family. He was tired and he would have no more of it. The boy rose from his empty fervor and made his way to the great doors of his castle. The members of his courts, his servants, his maids, his musicians, his courtiers, they all begged him not to go, but the boy paid them no heed. The coachman implored him to stop. Take a ride around the forest in your carriage, they said, and put your mind at ease. But the boy paid them no heed. Onward, the boy ran, through the thick of the woods, past the slippery rocks and towering trees, straight for home. And there was the edge of the forest, just in the distance. Wait, cried the flower. You visited your family once, and it brought you nothing but sadness. You visited them a second time, and it brought you nothing but sadness. Return to the castle, 
and cast aside such sorrows. But the boy paid it no heed. Up and over the hills he ran, bound for home. He leapt over the fence, ran to the door, and cried out, Mother! Brother! I'm here! The door creaked open, but it was not his mother who he met. It was not his brother who he met. No. At the foot of the door stood an old Baba, dressed in modest and rumpled cloth. Please, Baba, begged the boy. What happened to the woman and young man who lived here? I am sorry, replied the Baba, but they live here no longer. The woman succumbed to illness months ago. The young man has since left to find work elsewhere. The boy fell to his knees and began to shake in grief. His mother and his brother, both gone. He was alone. Alone, save for the flower. The flower that had once filled his every thought. The flower that had once granted his every wish. The flower that had lured him away from his home and family, but lure him away no longer. Jaka stood and asked the Baba if she knew which way his brother went. The Baba pointed down the road leading east, towards the morning sun. The boy thanked her. He reached into his pocket and found a gold coin from his stores in the castle. No! cried the flower. You cannot share your wealth with anyone, else you will lose everything. Remember the price of my power. The boy paid it no heed and handed the Baba his gold. The flower let out a horrid yell. The vines around his body and his heart began to wither and crumble into dust. The fancy clothing the boy had become accustomed to now transformed back into the humble clothes he wore years ago. His pockets, once filled to the brim with gold, now were filled only with dirt. A heavy weight was lifted from his being. He was finally free of the flower. Now, he was happy. Jacques thanked the Baba and ran off down the road. He would make up for the years he had wasted. His mother may have passed away, but somewhere out there was his elder brother. He would not lose him as well. He would reunite with his brother once more. And with the morning sun to guide him, off the boy ran, down the road, and over the horizon. You've been listening to The Flower of the Fern, featuring the voices of Fergie Philippe, Amy Snyder, Michaela Cohen, Lee Jenkins, and Stephanie Girding. Artwork by Melanie Pulsifer. Adapted, directed, edited, and music by Killian Poplick. All rights reserved. This audio play was produced for the Elon College Fellowship Program as part of the two-year apprenticeship requirement. Special thanks to Professor Kevin Otis, Dr. Suzanne Scheuer, Professor Scott Proudfit, Dr. Nina Namaste, and Professor Fred Rubick. Also special thanks to the Performing Arts Department of Elon University, the Spring Undergraduate Research Forum, and the Elon College Fellowship Program. Thank you for listening.